Please hear the word of God. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We are in the midst of Paul's great teaching to Titus and the Christians on the island of Crete. In in Titus 2, verses 11 through 15, his great teaching on God's grace. Yes, this is the foundation and the source for the good works and the godliness that he exhorts all types of people to pursue in verses 1 through 10. But then 11 through 15, he talks about God's grace. And we've been purposely spinning our wheels here on this wonderful and unique teaching in the Scriptures on the grace of God. We saw in verse 11 that this grace that appears as a saving grace, it brings salvation to all people. Verse 2, we saw the same grace that the saving grace is a sanctifying grace. The same grace that saves must by nature sanctify. In verse 12. But now we get to verse 13. And I keep calling this a second coming grace. And you might be thinking, second coming grace? What is that? I don't see that phrase often in Scripture or even mentioned. Did you make this up? How is Christ's second coming a part of His grace? And why is this so important? And why does it fit into this whole teaching of the grace of God that brings salvation and sanctifies? What is important is this is part of God's grace through Christ Jesus to us because the grace that appeared in Christ to bring salvation is the same grace that enables us to live out that salvation for Christ in this present age. And it is also the same grace that guarantees the culmination and the completion of our salvation when Christ returns in glory. We are to be eagerly longing for, expectantly looking forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord. That's what this verse is saying. My question from the outset would be, do you really long for and expectantly hope for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Savior? Is that something that's on your mind and on your heart? This longing, this eagerly expecting, should characterize our grace-filled lives in Christ. It is central to God's grace. It's central to our Christian lives. Christ speaks frequently in the Gospels of His return and the importance of it, that He will return in glory. The New Testament is filled with teaching and exhortation concerning our looking ahead for His return and the importance of His return. And the fact that we don't truly think that much about this is really an indictment against our heart and our focus as those who claim Christ and the grace that God gives us through Christ Jesus. If we are grateful for the grace of God that brings salvation and we long for the treasures of heaven, if we hate our sin and we long to be fully sanctified in soul and body, if we love our Lord and we long to see Him as He is and to be in His presence forever, if we desire more than anything else to see Christ glorified as Lord and King, then we will naturally and eagerly and expectantly look forward to the coming of our Savior. However, if we think so little of the grace of God, while we are consumed with the treasures of this world, if we are not bothered by our sin and we are not actively pursuing a godly life in and for Christ in the present age, if our love for Christ is cold and His presence and His glory is therefore rarely on our hearts or our minds, 
if our desires focus their attention on self and not on glorifying Christ with our lives, then sadly, we will have little evidence of such a longing for Christ's return in our lives. And sadly, according to the Scriptures, if this is true, this last part that I read is is true, we then have little evidence that the grace of God that brings salvation has actually appeared to us. Do you see the seriousness, the centrality, the importance of longing for and the expectancy of Christ's second coming and how God's grace and purposes are fulfilled in His second coming, that blessed hope? Today then, our goal is to be reminded of the centrality of the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of Christ. To see how longing for this should be characteristic in our lives we who are recipients of God's glorious grace, to see how longing for Christ's return and the blessed hope that comes with it, how that is necessary and it's a powerful help in our living for Christ now in the present age. And to see how this second coming and the longing for this blessed hope to come is yet one more wonderful part of the wondrous grace of God given to us for our joy and for His glory. All we're going to do today is look at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. I encourage you to memorize this, this whole passage from verses 11 through 15. I, just one verse at a time. It shouldn't be that hard. You might have it memorized already. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to look at this verse of Scripture very simply. Three parts. Well, first, we need to understand what is this looking for? What, what is Paul talking about? How is this characterized? This looking forward. And then we want to look at the two parts of what we're looking forward to. The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thought this was so simple. There was no need to make some kind of an alliteration so you can memorize the three points. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing. That's what we will look at this morning. Well, first of all, what does Paul mean when he says looking for or looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord? Well, the meaning of that phrase or that word looking, it means looking forward to and it means expectantly waiting for, eagerly looking forward to it. It's something that's dead set on our minds and our hearts and we're longing for it to come. We're not just kind of checking the newspapers once a week to see what's going on. We're we're looking for this. And if we understand the flow of the text from verse 12 to verse 13, I think it helps us to see how does this fit into the grace of God that saves and then the grace of God that sanctifies? How does this grace of God in the second coming of Christ, how does that fit? Well, the looking for in verse 13, grammatically, it modifies the living in verse 12. You may remember in verse 12, we saw that the grace of God that saves teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And when Paul says looking for, he's modifying the life live live for Christ in verse 12. The living soberly, righteously, and godly includes necessarily the looking for the blessed hope to come. Verse 12 ends with a focus on the present age. Verse 13 opens up with looking ahead to the second coming and the blessed hope in Christ Jesus. And so we can connect verse 12 and verse 13 in this way. The grace that teaches us to live consecrated lives. It teaches us to live consecrated lives while we are waiting expectantly for this blessed hope. In other words, the grace that brings salvation and the grace that sanctifies the Christian to live in this present age also is causing us to look forward at the same time to the goal and the glory of our salvation that will occur when Christ returns. What this means is that our lives as Christians, according to the grace of God that saves and sanctifies, Our lives should be characterized by this looking forward for Christ 
in this blessed hope and his glorious appearing. And so in verses 12 and 13, Paul has given us a very simple and memorable way to remember some key points of our living our Christian life. When you have a stool that you sit upon, it has at least three legs. If you don't have three legs, it'll tip over. But if you have a solid stool with three solid legs, it's firm. It does not tip over. And here those three solid legs would be denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. That's the negative. But then there's two positives. The living for Christ, soberly, righteously, and godly. And then the third leg, though, is looking ahead, focusing upon the blessed hope and glorious appearing of Christ. These are our keys, practical keys to our living the Christian life. And those of you who know Pastor Chris Marley from Arizona uh, would guess that if he preached on this, he'd have some Marleyisms that would very plainly make this, this point about the need for all three of these legs of the stool, the denying sin, the living for Christ, and looking forward to His return. He says, if, if only one of those legs are missing, you're in trouble. If you desire, de- deny sin, and if you live for Christ, but you are not watching for the blessed hope, He says, that's like walking across the desert and looking at the ground. And all you see is the ground. All you see is more desert, more sand. It gets depressing. But the adding to your denying sin and living for Christ, you adding that the looking up to the mountain range that's ahead, the goal of where you're walking, where there's shade, where there's shelter, where there's water, where there's rest, that's the analogy of looking ahead to the coming of Christ. We're no longer just seeing desert, 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 sand, sand, sand as we're walking and living this life on earth. We're seeing the glorious hope that rests ahead of us. That's the necessity of looking ahead. And the second point, if we deny sin and we're looking ahead for a blessed hope, but we're not purposely living this life for Christ, we might as well live in a monastery. And that's not what we're called to do. We are called to live out this life of sanctification for Christ. Not merely to deny sin and look ahead, but to live now for Christ. We need all three legs of the stool. And thirdly, if we are living for Christ now, and we are looking for Christ to come, but we're not actively denying sin in our life, this is where Chris Marley really comes in. It's like being in a rowboat with a hole in it. And you're bailing as fast as you can, but the boat still sinks you have to patch the hole so that no more sin comes in and you bail furiously to get rid of the stuff that's already there. And the third part, the looking ahead, is looking ahead to that glorious shore so you have a purpose and a goal for where you're rowing this boat to get to. And so we need the living for Christ, the denying sin, but then looking ahead for the glorious return of our Savior. And contrary to popular belief, that's two out of three are positive. Only one is negative. The Christian life is not merely no, 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 negative, negative, negative. Oh, there's some things we need to deny and say no to. But it's filled with a purposeful living for Christ and looking ahead for Christ's return. And all of this we can do because of and being empowered by the grace of God that brings salvation and that sanctifies. But the new leg on this stool that we brought into the conversation today is this looking ahead for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Savior. So I want us to spend the rest of our morning, the rest of the sermon anyway, on the blessed hope. What is this blessed hope and this glorious appearing? If we're to be expectantly, excitedly, eagerly looking ahead to this, we need to know what it is. And how can this help us now as we walk with Christ and deny sin? So we look on, we look forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing. I think to understand this verse more fully, it helps to understand the grammar behind it. With this blessed hope and glorious appearing, we have two nouns and one article. There's one the at the very beginning, but there's two nouns. And the two nouns, perhaps surprisingly, especially the way the New King James interprets this or translates this, the two nouns here are hope and glory. One article, one the, but then what? Then hope and glory are the two nouns. What this means is with one the, one article, but two nouns, it means both of those things, the hope and the glory, refer to the same event. They both refer to what happens when Christ returns. But because there are two nouns, it's somewhat, somewhat, there's a great amount of overlap 
but it somewhat emphasizes two aspects of the return of Christ. The first part being the hope that is blessed. That's what we'll look at first. But that blessed hope is talking about the realization of the blessedness of that hope. That which we are longing for in Christ's return. The realization of our eager expectation of Christ's second coming. The emphasis is on the benefits that flow to us when Christ returns. And the benefits are many. And if we focus on those things, it helps us greatly now in the present age. The second part, the glory. The New King James says the glorious appearing. That's a fine translation. Perhaps it makes it a little bit more clear, though, if we understand it means the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The emphasis is on the glory of His appearing. And so the emphasis of the second part is more so on Christ Himself and His glory when He comes. And so to be eagerly looking ahead to the blessed hope that emphasizes all the benefits we have when He comes and His glory when He appears, emphasizing the greatness of our Savior and His glory. So let's first of all look at the blessed hope. And I want to warn you ahead of time, I intend to keep you awake by making you fumble through the Scriptures this morning. I cannot explain this near as well as God's Word does. And God's Word is full of references to this blessed hope and glorious appearing. So you need to take your fingers and do one of these things. Of course, some of you have those evil worldly electronic gadgets that just poke, poke, poke. That's okay. Whatever you have to do, get ready. I want us to look through what the Scriptures say. And this isn't even near all of what we could look at. But let's let the Scriptures do the talking this morning. As we look at, first of all, this blessed hope. And then we'll focus on the appearing of His glory when He comes. I want you, first of all, to turn to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18. Romans chapter 8 has been called the greatest chapter in the Bible by some. I'm not qualified to verify that, but it is a very, very good chapter. And often when we think of Romans chapter 8, we think of those things that are said at the end, speaking of God's sovereignty. And those are wonderful, but I think we often neglect to see the whole picture of Romans chapter 8. And the emphasis that is in the first part, at least in the middle part, of God's glory when Christ comes and the expectation of the return of Christ that sets the background for verses 28 and following. And so if we look at verse 18, in chapter 8 of Romans, Paul begins by saying, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, he's comparing our suffering of this, of this current age, this present age. That's part of our sanctification. That's where we are. But he compares that with the glory which shall be revealed in us when? When Christ returns. And he says it doesn't compare. Right off the bat, you can see why if we look forward to this glorious appearing and the blessed hope, why it brings us so much help now. But look at what he says here. He says something that you might not expect. He doesn't say... The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of Christ. When He returns, He says, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whoa! Did you expect that? Did you pass over that when you've read that several times? What does that mean that the glory will, the glory will be revealed in us? Well, this should excite us because it means this blessed hope, and hope that we long for includes Christ's glory when he, is, when he comes will be revealed in His people. Why? Because when Christ returns, as we'll see later, we will be made like Him. Our, our being conformed in, into His image will be complete. We will be transformed into His image with Him in His glory. And when we are transformed to be as much like Him as we possibly can, His glory will be revealed in us. That should thrill your soul. And that should encourage you to live for Him now. Verse 19. A second point. Now he turns to creation. You understand that when Adam sinned, that all creation was thrown into sin and corruption as well. 
And the whole one of the great, make great themes of Romans chapter 8 is that all creation longs and expects the second coming of Christ because creation itself will be redeemed. And so in verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits. If creation is eagerly awaiting this, I think we should as well. But look what creation is eagerly expecting for the revealing of the sons of God. Again, I don't want to make you prideful, but look at the emphasis on us who have been redeemed by grace. Creation expects not right away. Hey, I'm going to be redeemed, but creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. It's much like verse 18. When Christ returns, it's almost as if we, Christ's people, will be put on public display before all of creation. And it will be revealed, these are the ones whom Christ loved and died for. These are the ones to whom Christ's grace was applied and His glory is revealed in them. And they are revealed as sons of God. I was expecting someone to, to clap or to jump up. This is exciting stuff. This is, what, this is what lies for us. This is what awaits for us. And we should be eagerly expecting it. As we read on in verses 20 through 22, if I read them all, we'll never get through this morning. But I'm hoping you're somewhat familiar with Romans chapter 8. But in verses 20 through 22, then it, Paul does actually write that creation itself is longing for and looking to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Yes, Creation longs to be redeemed from sin as well. And so we have Christ's glory revealed in us. Our being revealed as the sons of God. The creation itself being redeemed and taken out of the bondage to corruption. Now look at verse 23 through 25. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting, the same phrase that we see in Titus 2, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The point is, and I ask this question often and the answer is always yes, don't you long to have a completely transformed, glorified body like Christ and be out of this sin-stricken shell of a body that we have now? And when Christ returns then our bodies will be transformed, the corruptible will be put aside, the incorruptible body will be given, we'll have the body like Christ's glorified body, and the redemption of our body will be complete when Christ returns then to match our sinless soul that's already been given. In verse 24, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Well, verses 26 through 27 speak of the Spirit interceding on our behalf, helping us when we don't know what to pray. But then we get ready for verses 28 and following. I would like to think you're familiar with verses 28 and following. But before we look at verses 28 and following, remember what we've just read. The background is the return of Christ, His glory being revealed in us on that great day when we be fully glorified in Him. We being revealed as His sons, as God's sons, Creation being redeemed from sin. Our bodies being redeemed from sin. Then when we get to verse 28, that's the background. And how Paul is basically saying, from the very beginning to the very end, this has been God's sovereign plan for His people. And He's working out all things for good according to this purpose and for His glory. And so we see in verse 28, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We've already known now that the end is secure. Our, our, our final, uh, the completion of our salvation rests secure in Christ, what we've read already. Verse 29, for whom He foreknew, that means who He set His love upon in advance, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also what? Glorified. And that happens at the second coming of Christ when we see the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We will finally be conformed to the image of the Son, glorified in Him. It's guaranteed. It's promised. It's planned. And we see how it carries out from the beginning to the end. And therefore... Verses 31 through 37, I will not read those, but verses 31 through 37, 
You understand the rest of this. It starts off saying, What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then what Paul says, all of the trials and tribulations that could occur in this present age, what does it matter? It doesn't matter because no one can bring a charge against God's elect. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. In all things, we are more than conquerors through Him who has loved us. Take heart, press on in this present age, because it's all guaranteed in Christ Jesus by the grace of God. Do you get it? This is only the first section of Scripture we'll look at. I've got to hurry. But already we see, what is this blessed hope and this glorious appearing of Christ? And how does it bring us great joy and encouragement now? Well, we know that then God's or Christ's glory will be revealed in us. We know at that point that we will be revealed to all of creation as God's sons and daughters. We know at that point that creation will rejoice in being redeemed. Our bodies will be redeemed. We know that the predestined purpose and promise for us to be conform to the image of Christ here, will now finally be completed in glorification in Christ's presence. And we will indeed be conquerors in Christ Jesus at that time, because Christ Jesus is the conqueror. And so no matter what the trials and tribulations we face now, it pales in comparison. It's nothing compared to the glory that awaits us upon the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're still focusing somewhat on the blessed hope, but I say there's overlap between the blessed hope and the benefits that come and the glory of Christ Himself. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verses 13 and 14, the idea is this, that since Christ rose from the dead, and He did, then we know that all those who die in Him will be raised from the dead as well. All those who have been redeemed by Christ, that their bodies lie in the grave, they're asleep in Christ, and they will be raised when Christ returns. That's what the first two verses say. But then we look at verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, we who are alive and remain, those who are not dead when Christ returns, And remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, the word asleep is meaning those who are already dead when Christ returns. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. We just sang this. And with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Won't that be glory? And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That would be enough, I hope, to make you long for it. But look at that last verse. We have some application. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. We, not just me, but we, all believers, all believers will be together with the Lord without division. There will only be one church, one denomination, one set of doctrines. Won't that be glory? We shall always, permanently, forever, with sinless souls, with sinless bodies, and with one sinless body, capital B, the body of Christ will be fully redeemed and made whole as we are before Christ forever. We shall always be with the Lord. Brother and sister, that should be the greatest longing of our heart. That we will be with Him. The greatest hope of all that we will be with Him and we'll see Him like He is with no sin in between. So therefore, he says in verse 18, comfort one another, therefore, with these words. A very clear and practical application is this. This is a blessed hope because all believers without division will be before the Lord without sin and we will be with Him always. We will be with Him always and this should comfort our souls now. Got it? Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 17. 
Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 17. In verses 17 through 19, the context there is that Paul is exhorting the Christians to follow his example, to note those who walk according to this pattern, this pattern of Paul. But then he compares them in verse 18, Philippians 3 verse 18, of those who are not walking according to the pattern of Christ, those who are not redeemed by Christ. And this is rather sad and startling. For many walk, verse 18, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. Oh, that we had the compassion of the heart of the Apostle Paul for the lost. That they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Remember, Christ died for us while we were still enemies. While there's nothing about us to love, but those who are outside of Christ are still enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. That means all of the things of the world, the fleshly desires, that's what their will revolves around. And whose glory is in their shame. And they've set their mind on earthly things. That describes the one who has not been redeemed by the grace of God through Christ. But then verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. Reminds us that we are temporary pilgrims here. This is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. From which, from heaven, from which we also eagerly wait. What? For the Savior. Eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Very simply, as we eagerly await the Savior who comes from heaven where we belong, our bodies will be transformed unto His glorious body. He will subdue all things to Himself. The church, all of creation, all things will finally be fully subdued by Christ Jesus. And then at the next point, if you turn to Philippians 4 verse 1, Therefore, my beloved, therefore, my beloved, and longed for brethren, oh, if we would have the love for the brethren like Paul has as well, He longs for Christ, but He longs for His brethren. My joy and crown, therefore, stand fast in the Lord. So this blessed hope is practical now. It brings us comfort, but it also helps us to stand fast. We know what it lies ahead. It's promised. It's secure. So we can stand fast in the Lord now. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. I can tell when you're getting a little bit drowsy. So turn to 1 John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3 are another set of wonderful scriptures that should excite your soul for the salvation we have in Christ. Especially understanding our sinfulness, our hopelessness, and seeing the grace of God that brings salvation to even us. We see in 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, Behold what manner of love. I wish I'd explain to you how this is really being expressed in the original. It's like, wow! What, What love this is! Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed, has gifted, has granted upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. When Christ is revealed at the appearing of His glory and the blessed hope that we long for, we shall be like Him, transformed into His image, and we will see Him like He is. Could we see Him like He is now? Then all sin will be eradicated. We will be able to see Him like He is. Again, that should be the greatest hope of all. Even considering all of these benefits, the fact benefits the fact that we can see Christ and be with Him forever, and therefore the application we've had comfort, we've had stand fast. Now it says, "This hope 
in Christ purifies us because he is pure. We contemplate the purity, the holiness of our Savior and his coming back. It makes us want to be prepared. It makes us want to be longing for that. He is going to make us pure then. Let's get this thing going now and let's live for Christ and deny sin and ungodliness in our life. Now it purifies us, it comforts us, it helps us to stand firm. This is just tipping our toes in the water of the New Testament of all the blessings that come when this blessed hope appears. Christ, His glory is revealed in us. We are revealed as His Creation is redeemed. Our bodies are redeemed. The predestined purpose of God for us to be glorified in Christ is going to be realized. We will be conquerors with the one who conquers all. We will be together before Him without sin. We will be with Him always without sin. All things will be subdued unto Him. We will be like Him. We will see Him as He is. There is great comfort We stand fast and we are purified even now because of these things. Do you understand this blessed hope? And why we are to be longing for this and looking forward to this and how this helps us even now by God's grace? Now let's look at the glorious appearing. We long for, we look ahead, it's part of the the characteristic of our life for Christ, longing for the blessed hope and all the benefits that come from it, but also then the glorious appearing or the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. It's probably more accurately said, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The emphasis being on Christ and His glory. Do you see the parallel between verse 11 and verse 13? In verse 11, we see the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. In verse 13, we're looking ahead for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Christ appeared in grace when He came the first time, being born of a virgin, born to die and to live for His people. Christ will appear in glory when He returns at His second coming to complete what He has begun in His people. Turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And look at verses 1 through 5 to begin with. A very famous, important passage. Christ's great high priestly prayer as He's praying to the Father before He goes to the cross. And He's speaking here to His Father and praying to His Father that He has completed His work. He actually hasn't done it in time, but it's done. It's finished. He's going to soon say, it is finished. He says, I've completed my work that you've sent me to do. I've completed the work to save the people that you have given to me, Father. Those people you've set aside to me to redeem specifically. I've done this and now I'm going to give them into your hands and I'm going to return unto glory. And in verses 1 through 5, we see that. I want you to look at verse 4. I have glorified you on earth. This is Christ praying to the Father. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We get a glimpse in this that in Christ's first appearing, in some way, He never became less glorious or less God, but in some way, He he laid aside His glory. His glory wouldn't be shining forth because He came in grace. He says, now that I'm coming back to you, share with me the glory that we shared before. But I've laid aside my glory as I came as a humble, obedient servant. I came in grace, not in glory. And now in the second appearing, the second coming, that blessed hope and glorious appearing, He will come in full glory as the great God and Savior to be beheld. Skip down to verse 24 in John chapter 17. If you skip down to verse 24 in in chapter 17 of John, listen to this. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me. He's he's speaking about all those who believe his people have been set aside to him by the Father. He says, I desire that they also whom you gave me. Listen to this. 
may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Christ Jesus, our great God and Savior, the Lord of glory, He says to the Father, and He's praying this, so you know it's true and it will be, He desires, Christ desires that we whom God gave Him would be with Him where He is at. He desires for His people to be with Him. He desires us to be with Him. Christ does. And He also desires that they, we, would behold His glory. And brother and sister and and friend, if Christ desires us to be with Him, and if Christ desires that we behold His glory, how much more eager should we be to be with Him and to behold His glory and desire this blessed hope and His glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is coming in glory as God and Lord In John chapter 17, when he says, Glorify me with the glory I had before with you, this is his claim to being God. In Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah writes that Jehovah does not share his glory with anyone else. And so for Christ to say, Share with me again the glory that we had before, he's saying, I am God. And I will be glorified as God. In Titus chapter 2 verse 13 When he says, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, the way this is constructed, there's no other way to understand this than he's saying that Christ is both God and Savior. And then a letter to Titus, Paul seems like he's, he just keeps getting confused. He calls, he says, God our Savior, then Christ our Savior, then God our Savior, then Christ our Savior. Here he says, Christ is our great God and Savior. Christ is God and he's coming back in glory. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, Christ says, in the same context where He says, deny yourself and follow Me, what what was it worth if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul? And then to drive that point home, He says, the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. We only have two more stops here and one more. We're done. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. I think you're familiar with this passage. I'll remind you that this passage, when he speaks about every knee bowing and every tongue confessing, Paul is referring to a passage in Isaiah chapter 45 that is referring to Jehovah God. That before Jehovah God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so this is applied in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 to Christ. This is saying that Christ Himself is indeed Jehovah God and He's coming back in glory. And you know this passage, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, it means by nature He's always been God. And because of that, He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It was no big deal for Him to say, hey, I'm God, because that's who He is. Verse 7, but He made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he is fully God and fully man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The Son had to become like his people, to live in their place and to die in their place, to redeem them to himself. But Paul doesn't stop there. In verse 9, Therefore, Therefore God has also highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess, what? Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, He is God, to the glory of God the Father. This is the coming of our great God and Savior in glory. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior We long for the blessed hope, but we long for this as well, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I want to close by looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want us to close with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. I think these seven verses are a much overlooked passage when we think about the return of Christ. 
But I think the refined summary of what we've seen today about the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Christ and how this affects us, we who are his people, but also what this means for those who are outside of Christ. We have said that this blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Savior should enable us and encourage us to not just long for what will be, but to help us to live for Christ now until He comes. And when Christ returns in glory, we will see Him as He is. We will be made like Him. And we will be with Him forever with no sin in between us and Him and no sin in between us as His people. Our salvation... Our sanctification, our transformation will be complete when He returns. Our hope, our blessed hope will be realized and this should be the longing of our hearts and people. He, Christ, should be the longing of our hearts. And Scripture tells us that this hope comforts us, it purifies us, it helps us to stand firm, it gives us purpose and joy no matter what's going on in this present age. And so we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Verses 10 through 12 first, for the believer, this will be addressed to the Christian who's been saved by this wonderful grace of God. Starting in verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians, it's speaking of the rest that we have when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In verse 10, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. That was what we saw in Romans chapter 8, wasn't it? We used to think about him being glorified, but he will be glorified in his saints. Glory be to God and to be admired, to be beheld among all those who believe, because our testimony among you is believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him, according to the grace, the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, because of His revealing Himself in us and because of His being admired by us, we're to be striving to walk worthy of the calling that He's given us by the grace of God. But notice that last line in verse 12 is because so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him. I think what this is saying is that since Christ will be glorified in us and we will be glorified in Him when He appears in glory... Therefore, we should now deny sin and live for Christ in this present age so that even now Christ would be glorified in us and we would be glorified in Him. Even now, according to the grace of God that brings salvation, sanctification, and promises the second coming. But please hear me in verses 7 through 9. Those who are outside of Christ, please hear me. Those who are outside of Christ, This return of Christ, for those who are outside of Christ, will not be a blessed hope. It says in verses 6 and 7 that God will repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is is revealed. Those who are outside of Christ, those who are enemies of the cross, those whose God is their belly, whose end is destruction, when Christ is revealed... Tribulation will be repaid upon those who continue to sin against holy God. And look what is in store for those who are outside of Christ. Christ is revealed with his mighty angels. But look at verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Do you understand what's being said there? That for the Christian, the very glory and presence of Christ is what he longs for, and what he lives for, and what he can't wait to see. But if you're outside of Christ, that same glory and that same presence cannot be beheld or admired, but it will be a terror and a horror to you. That same glory and presence of our holy God and Savior Christ will be a terror and a horror for you. Because it brings eternal judgment upon those who are not redeemed, casting them into wrath forever. So I plead with you 
Won't you bow the knee before Christ and repent of your sins and confess Him as Lord? Won't you do now this bowing before Christ and confessing Him while grace has appeared for you and before glory appears and judgment and wrath for you? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Oh, we've gone long this morning and we've gone deep through many scriptures. Perhaps this is too much, but I pray, Lord, that this would be laying down a foundation for all of us so we could go back and look at these things later, even today, to see the wonder, the joy, the promise, the comfort, the purity, the standfastness, the great longing for and looking forward to the, the blessed hope and the appearing of glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, this, the grace that saves is the same grace that sanctifies and is the same grace that secures the completion of this salvation when Christ returns in glory. I pray that those who are in Christ, we would rejoice. We would be humbled by this. This is all by grace. We deserve none of this. And may it encourage us to serve you with joy and gladness and a proactivity to deny sin to live for Christ and to long for, to look for the glorious appearing and the blessed hope of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for those who are outside of Christ. Lord, Paul weeps for those who are outside of Christ. May our hearts go out for those who are outside of Christ and never, never grow slack in our prayers and our desires for them to come to know this grace that saves and sanctifies and secures I pray, Lord, that the same second coming that gives a Christian great joy and hope, that same second coming will be contemplated by those who are outside of Christ. And you would properly give them a great fear and a terror because in their sin, in their rebellion, if they are in the presence of Christ and in the presence of His glory, they will be consumed. They will be judged, rightfully so, forever. I beg of you, Lord, that the grace of God that brings salvation would appear even today to those who are outside of Christ. It's in Christ's blessed name we pray these things.